Welcome, everyone. Today is March 1st, 2023. This is Texpressionism Salon number 64. Uh, our topic today is layers. Uh, my name is Michael Pierre Price, and I'll be today's moderator. Uh, we've been meeting for now about two and a half years, which is pretty phenomenal. Uh, Colin Goldberg uh, kind of got things rolling here, uh, coined the phrase, and uh, helped spur this this wonderful community of ours. So thank you, Colin. Um, You're welcome. And anyone that's not um, presenting, if you could just mute your microphones, that'd be appreciated just to keep the feedback yeah, down. Yeah, thanks. Um, so before we before we get going on today's topic, um, we do have an announcement that Cynthia Beth Rubin would like to make. So uh, Cynthia, why don't you go ahead? Okay, so um, I'm just going to put a link here in the chat. Um, with Sue Golifer, I am moderating a session through SIGGRAPH. Um, SIGGRAPH has a series that meets monthly called Sparks that is somewhat similar to the format that we've been doing here, where people present briefly um, along a theme. And the theme that we have is called Mixing It Up, which is mixed media. So we are interested in proposals for people to present in five-minute lightning talks um, about works that either go in and out of the computer, either 3D or 2D or both, or mix within the computer, mixing ways, um, things that people may have thought of as discrete media, like for instance, CAD programs and paint programs. You know, they usually don't mix, but they might mix digitally. So we're interested in anything that's an unusual mixture. And uh, a little bit, um, I've been thinking about the question of uh, materiality and kind of where does this fit? So um, from that link, there's a a link that tells us tells you more tells you the time it's eastern time at four o'clock on a friday i said i would be brief so that's what i'm going to do people who have questions can email me or ask me more later at the end i'll stick around for the end okay great thanks thanks cynthia uh SIGGRAPH's a wonderful organization so yeah good uh, good announcement for us um okay so Layers. Um, I, I think this is a wonderful topic, uh, especially for digital artists uh, and and those who who work uh, either digitally or computer wise. Um, the the go to program, oftentimes Photoshop or Photoshop clones, uh, their hallmark is is this idea of layers, um, and for modern digital musical recordings. Uh, multiple tracks, uh, again, layers within music recording. Um, and, to, and today I think it's really kind of interesting because this is salon number 64, uh, which 64 is a power of two. So again, uh, and it's all coming together. So I really like that. Um, and, Commodore and, 64. Yes, exactly. 64 bit computing and all of that. So I just I think it's lovely uh, that we're that we're having this conversation today, um, and and then also um, just sort of the the meaning of layers uh, is something that we use linguistically to peel back layers to find out what's at the crux of something, uh, and layers implies complexity and depth, which I think for this for this group of artists is something that we all sort of thrive on and uh, utilize in our work every day. Um, and also connections and information and strata and evolution. So I think there's a lot here for us to look at and talk about. Um, and I'm happy to introduce Susan Detroit to be our first artist presenting today. So go for it, Susan. Thank you. Oh, and I just wanted to chime in. Um, when presenters come on, if you could just um, state where you're zooming in from also, that would be oh, awesome. Thanks. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Susan Detroit. I'm in Oregon, in the Val Willamette Valley of Oregon. Um, that was a great introduction, Michael, because 
I was relating to all the words that you were using that seemed apropos of, of what I create. And so I'm going to do my best to screen share. Okay, so um, I decided I was going to, um, uh, I'm going to pick here, I'm actually going to time myself. I decided um, I wanted to show a little bit of my past work because it so deeply influences the layered type of work I do now. In um, the 90s, I was creating pieces like this with dragonfly and cactus theme using historic uh, processes, which you can see are deeply layered, um, cyanotype, and then uh, also uh, uh, liquid transfers. Uh, another piece that had uh, Van Dyke brown and then layered with uh, markings. This was when I start, this piece here is representative when I started using uh, uh, layers that are created with matte medium. And um, this is another piece that uses that similar work. It's a close up of a transfer piece. And um, this is a short video that shows the type of transfer I was creating that I put on my pieces. Um, and here it is dried and I'm drawing on it, creating a layer that goes on a canvas. Um, so then uh, in, the, let's see, then in the 2000s, I started mixing digital and layering with photographic work that I was using. And here you can see I've used uh, flowers that were actually adhered to a piece. And, and I've also done a transfer and then used that to create a layer with my own face in a digital way. And then I became more, I guess if I'd say assertive, aggressive about my layering using the natural world and my own face and started a series called Portrait of a Woman that I've been doing uh, six years now. Uh, I, a section of that work layers my own face with leaves. And so there's a mini section uh, of that uh, project. And this is a more current piece that I did that I took my own face and then layered it with an image that I created from uh, like a forest uh, photograph, uh, put it through iColorama and actually it's now an NFT and it moves and I, I don't have that one in the lineup here, but I just minted that, what day is today? Wednesday, uh, Monday. It has uh, butterflies in it. I'm also starting to work with AI using my own face and layering it with roses. This is an experiment. I haven't done much else with it. And then the last thing that, that I'm doing that I haven't is I'm creating pieces that look like this um, that I call a planetary sisters. And this is actually a combination of several layers of app work, but I began with an AI, this AI image that I generated with Wombo. And then I used my own face and then I layered my face into this AI face and I created her. <laughs> and um, I have a number of these that I'm working on. I haven't really, I haven't uh, shown them or done much with them. Um, I did enter this one into a, a mobile photography and it got an, an honorable mention. And I think that's it. Hey, that was like just about, okay, stop. Here we go. I'm back, I think. Okay, I'm back. So um, I feel like I could say that um, ditto to Roz, like layer is me. <laughs> I um, really uh, 
I use layers all the time. Uh, I've been using layers for since the 90s to produce work and I I adore using layers and I always feel excited when I have the opportunity to talk about layers even though I knew it was going to be a time crunch. I really wanted to show that a, a little history of my own work. So thanks that a was, lot. That was great, Susan. Thank you. Wonderful You're welcome. presentation. I, I do want to have a brief announcement. I still 10 seconds. One of my NFT pieces called Respiro, which is part of the Las uh, Flores de Venus, is um, I've I entered it and it's going to be shown in um, I'm ex Bucharest, Romania, uh, in uh, in March. I've re kind of remastered it and made it longer. I did a few things more with it, and it I sent it to them uh, last week, and it's going to be in a show in Romania that is focused on um, femininity, archaic to contemporary. And I'm super excited about the crossover. So thank you. Awesome. All right. Done. <laughs> Thanks a okay. lot. Okay, uh, Karen Lafleur. You're still muted, you're, Karen. You're muted, Karen. There we go. Um, hi, everyone. I'm from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and I'm hopefully at this point can see my screen. Can you see my screen with all the navigators on the left? Yay. <laughs> see if we can play this. All right. You should be able to see the full screen now. Perfect. Um, thank you for the segue, Susan and Ross, because yes, layers are my life too, in many different ways. And I can't think of layers without thinking of patterns and the illusion of depth. So I'm gonna kind of briefly go through all of these really quickly. And I am also want to talk about layers in this context, that layers are experiences in life. And as a child, this was my playground. My grandfather and my father owned a foundry. There were 50 uh, real old timers, uh, first generation from many countries around the world. And I would play here with all the, these are patterns that you're looking at right now for castings. These are my play toys <laughs> and all the layers that they created. Plus the old timers would tell me these amazing stories. My mother was also an amazing seamstress, so I would come home from school and there would be patterns self-made all over the floor. So I also have this experience. So that today I can look at anything, not a model, but not a, not a, not a, uh, a, a pattern, paper pattern to follow, but I can look at anything and build anything. So this is a Blario plane, it's about 20 by 24 inches. And I transferred that into working with a lot of fabrics throughout my career. This is a rug pattern, um, how they're all segregated into the different colors. And also in traditional forms, I've worked in a lot of mediums. This is a five color litho off a stone a pole. It's about 30 by uh, 20 by 30 inches on this one. What you're seeing on the right is the actual light table I'm working on. On the left is the final print. So by the time I ended up with Photoshop version 101, actually, I wish I still had it because I think of it as an antique. Um, this was like the perfect medium for me, even though technology at the time was a bit of a mystery back in 1981 to most of the population. Uh, but I saw it as an, an amazing layer tool. So what you're looking at right now is an older piece of mine, one of the first ones that I did. Um, these layers, that you, these little objects that you're looking at in reality are only about an inch high. But I started to look at those layers in that drawing and I realized I had thousands of these intricate little drawings that I could do something with, which was like, going into like atomic energy of layers it was like kept going and going inside itself so i started to do this as a still of my first animation um and i'm not showing animations tonight that's what i normally do uh because zoom is a little hard on the animation so just going to show you skill uh stills 
Um, and this taught me an enormous amount because suddenly I started to introduce depth. So between patterns, layers, and depth, this is my palette. Um, and I kind of think of layers as sort of the, the middle of the sandwich and the pattern and the depth on either side, but they're all part and parcel of the same thing. And when I got to this stage, the storyteller in me writing all these stories, I think influenced by all those old timers that used to tell me stories in the, in the foundry from their home countries, um, I started to combine text and image. And I actually have uh, uh, two master's degrees in text and image. And the layering allowed me to be able to play with the visuals in the story and decide which colors, which visuals, which layers pushed the narrative forward the best. So I found this to be an amazing tool, which I bring into my animation. This is surface below. It starts in the upper uh, left as an ice flow up in the Arctic. And as the ice breaks open, it goes through layers and layers until it reaches the bottom of the ocean. Again, I'm working with narrative. Even if you see my abstractions, it's narrative. So this is a recent piece of mine. Um, and this is sort of like a, a larger detail of the piece. So you can start to see how all the different layers, again, nest inside themselves, inside themselves. They're telling stories. And this is the biggest fascination for me with layers is the ability to create a narrative. This is the uh, a detail of one of those pieces. And again, I have control of every dot, every color, they're all in their layers, which will again, turn around and become more animations down the road. And that's the final piece. So I'll end it there because I don't want to take up more than my five minutes, but I wanted to kind of get that journey in there. <laughs> Thank you. I can get That's really uh, a wonderful illustration, Karen, of uh, the whole layer idea. So thank you. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, uh, Chalda is next. I'm Chalda. I'm in Austin, Texas. And uh, like some of these others, I've been uh, working as an artist for, in my case, seven decades. And uh, I have always really enjoyed um, layers. This is an older piece. I couldn't even tell you um, what year I did it. It's called Fish Eye, and that's the entire piece. It's about 20 by 28, and it's acrylic. And uh, working in acrylic, working on transparent layers, I really found it a pleasurable way to uh, create the image and also um, a way to give a kind of an airy ethereal quality that I, I really kept throughout um, all my career through working with the various different media. Uh, this is a piece I did in probably the 80s. It's called Starburst and it's an aqua tint. And uh, aqua tint um, is inherently uh, you have to do it in layers. And uh, what makes it different from the previous media that I had been working in is um, each time you do a layer, you have to consider the entire frame. Whereas like with uh, acrylics or oil, you can, you can work up layers regionally. Um, but here, uh, the process is you have a metal plate and you use a ground which stops out the acid and you use successive acid baths. So um, you really have to consider the entire frame each time you do another bath, each time you add another layer. Um, and so that introduced to my mind um, another way of thinking. Um, you cannot easily go back and change a layer or in, in um, 
there are workarounds. You can kind of buff out an area. Uh, um, it's very difficult. Um, basically, once you've got it in the plate, it, it's very hard to change your mind. Um, then when I went into digital, um, I started out with uh, Fractal Painter. Uh, it wasn't called in those days. Now it's Corel Painter and Photoshop. And um, the exciting thing was being able to keep all the layers active um, during the creative process. And I felt that this really helped me um, get stronger compositions and uh, also um, a more intuitive creative flow. Um, you have all these transparent layers and you can go back to like layer three and tweak the whole palette maybe. Um, so there were just all kinds of options. And, and there's some effects you can only get by maybe merging two layers, creating them separately and um, merging two. Um, this is in a series called, uh, of um, insects that I did called beings. And this one's called champion. Um, I usually work in maybe eight or 10 layers and um, keep them active for the whole creative process. Um, also, when I um, do my presentation, I usually use um, very small editions. I present them in maybe editions of three, and I call them editions varie, uh, which means there will be very small changes um, between printings. So each one is unique. But if someone, for example, uh, sees a piece in a gallery and buys uh, another one in the edition, it'll have the same composition, the same palette. And you have to kind of really hold them one next to the other to see what the differences are. Um, and the, but the layers are very helpful in that process. Here's another one called Winged Victory uh, after the piece, the famous piece in the Louvre. This is kind of my take on it. And uh, again, you get this ethereal, uh, very lively quality um, with the layers in Photoshop. I usually um, use both programs, um, kind of weave the same image back and forth because they have different kind of options. And uh, here is a detail image of that piece. So you can see it, it couldn't really have been done any other way than uh, with a lot of layers. I'm like Roz, layers are my middle name. Um, I, I enjoy them hugely. Wonderful, Chalda, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're we're moving along very nicely here. So, uh, Colin, you want to go next, then? Sure. All right. Um, so I'm Colin Goldberg, zooming in from uh, Cambridge, New York, and uh, let me just share my screen here. I'm gonna share sound also. So. Uh, let me know if you could still hear me. Can you guys still hear me now that I'm sharing? Okay. Um, so I'm going to show a piece that um, is uh, an NFT that I just minted. It's part of a series um, that I've been working on for probably a little over a year now. Um, and it's based on some digital drawings that I did between 1999 and 2004. Uh, and the series is called Metagraphs. And uh, I named it that because the um, the image is sort of like a, the, the sort of uh, idea is that the actual piece is the code and it's the vector file versus the way that it's um, kind of materialized into a physical object. So um, this piece is um, the illustrator file. That's the original drawing from 2004. And you could see it's in, it's in layers. Um, and each one of these elements is in layers. And uh, the background is actually um, based on a photograph of trees. 
Um, that was a film photograph taken back in probably around 2004 that was scanned in, vectorized in Illustrator. Um, this part is sort of like a blend uh, from two different forms and it's all vector-based drawing. So um, the NFT part is um, what I did was, and this is one thing I really like about the Adobe suite is all the apps are pretty nicely interoperable. And uh, so I imported the, the drawing into Adobe Animate, which uh, is basically um, the current incarnation of, of Flash, which um, was basically, uh, you know, sort of dismantled when Steve Jobs decided that iOS devices wouldn't run Flash. Um, but it was reborn as Adobe Animate, which is basically the same exact program. It's also Flash was originally based on a program called Macromedia Director, which was used for CD-ROM authoring. And uh, most of uh, the UI is the same. It's this sort of timeline-based um, interface. And you can see each one of these layers came in to Adobe Animate, and that software was used to create the animation um, by a process called tweening, where uh, each one of these elements is sort of rotated and moves around in space to create the animation. And each one of these pieces is 23 seconds long. Um, there's sort of a significance to that in that um, my birthday is on the 23rd of December and my daughter's birthday is on the 23rd of June. Um, she was actually born at 623 on 623, which uh, is kind of interesting. So I've kind of incorporated some numerology into my work. And then this is the same, this is the Adobe Animate piece brought into Premiere, which you can also see incorporates layers. This is the video track, and these are sound samples um, that are used to create the, the audio soundscape. So I'm just going to um, open up the final file and play it for you guys. All right. turn the audio on here. So that's the uh, that's the NFT. It's kind of the soundscape is influenced uh, by um, bebop, jazz, which I'm a big fan of. And uh, this is, I think, number eighteen of this um, series, which is uh, minted on Foundation. Um, so there's a whole slew of them, and there will be a total of twenty three when the series is complete. So that's it. Awesome. That was Thank that you. was a very nice instructive uh, demo of uh, showing off layers, Colin. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think those of us who who work digitally, we kind of innately like this is like secondhand. But to those who don't, I think it's a, a good instruction. So thank you. Um, okay, I'm not sure who wants to go next. So somebody want to raise their hand? Okay, Cynthia. Now I know Roz wanted to go. Am I jumping the line here? Not she at all. Too, Please go right ahead. <laughs> all right, right ahead. Thank you, Roz. <laughs> Cynthia, you're we muted. Lost, we lost your audio. Sorry about that. I'm Cynthia DiDonato, and I'm zooming in from North Providence. And I'm going to start sharing to get right to. Uh, it says ask. Oh, no, sorry. Here we go. iPad. Share. I'm getting uh, a plug in. In order to share. 
And let's see. Okay, can you see my, you can see my granddaughter. Okay, uh, let me first say that, can, can everyone see what I have on my iPad screen? Yes. Great. Yep. Okay, my, I do uh, layering for most of my pieces. Um, I use it to create depth and interesting uh, compositional forms. I like to use my traditional analog water media that I've done and um, then use that in the layering process. I also like to digitally paint in software and use that in the layering process. And then of course, I also use photographs sometimes as a base layer or for manipulation. So what I'm gonna be showing you tonight is a variety of things uh, that are parts of series. And uh, let me start with the first piece. Okay, this is a water media piece uh, that I did uh, a while ago, and I began manipulating it by blending it with another layer or several layers in and out of softwares. I like to use Procreate, I like to use Decimate, I like to use um, uh, Icolorama. And here I was layering, I, I took a picture of the original painting and then I took another a layer of the same painting and then began to manipulate that layer on top of this one. And um, then I animated it and this ended up in the uh, Kunst Matrix to Expressionist exhibit a few years, years ago. And then finally, the same piece that you saw as a water media piece, this is the last ma manipulation of it. And this I call division and it's uh, NFT uh, up on first dibs. Here's another piece that I did where I painted digitally and began to create layers. And if I show you the film here, you'll begin to see the layers as they come in. Here's another piece that's again digitally painted. Uh, here are the layers you can see in Procreate. Uh, there are only four layers, including the background. And so I'm able to, you know, wonderfully, as you know, many of you do, is to manipulate, move around those layers. Here's another piece I did that, again, I enjoy creating depth. And one of the ways I can do it is with layers. And some of the layers are actually shadows that. Uh, are placed there. And this one is probably one of the larger pieces that I did. In fact, you might recognize at the bottom, this layer was a piece I showed when we were talking about using AI as part of uh, a piece. So I used that AI piece um, and manipulated it to get the shapes, uh, the uh, main shape that you see over to the left. And then I did some repetitions in uh, reducing the shapes. Here's another piece. Again, this is all digitally painted to start with. And as you can see, all of the layers uh, placed in here. Uh, here's another one where I was having fun again with shape and manipulation and shadows. And you can see the layers here. Again, same process uh, where I was able to use layers. This was probably a painted piece, uh, digitally painted that I manipulated. Uh, this is one of my favorite pieces. And again, if you look at the number of manipulations that this piece went through to create this you know, final piece with all of these um, shapes and going every which way. Uh, here's a piece that I had done that was originally a photograph that I used uh, in a program called Paper Camera. And again, uh, there are layers. I don't have a picture of the layers for you, but I guess you can see that there must have been. Oh, I do have it. Sorry about that. 
Uh, this is another piece I did for a show in Providence. Uh, they wanted to deal with uh, computers. And uh, again, this has uh, quite a few layers uh, to create this form. Now here's layering just using one layer where I would actually, I created my own brush and using that brush repetitively, I was able to create a layered feeling. Here I used layers and manipulation of shapes. This is a photograph of fabric and I love fabric and textiles. And I was able to manipulate the shapes to create this somewhat ballet like feel. These do not have, I uh, do not have the layers to show you. And the same principle exists here with this piece and with this piece. Uh, this is another of my favorite pieces. Again, I painted a series of gold shapes and then repeated them ad infinitum until I got them into this very tiny, tiny line forms. This is a piece that I've been working in a series of red that you saw a while ago I presented. And so I then created a, a video and this is just a piece of a video that I'm working on with again, repeated shapes and um, effect is the program that creates the video and does the layering of the pieces. And that is the end. I thank you for listening. Thank you, Cynthia. Very nice. Once again, great to see, great to see the details behind the scenes there. Okay, since Roz has been mentioned uh, several times now, I guess, uh, if she's still here, uh, let's go, Roz. <laughs> I'm here, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm actually uh, tuning in from St. Petersburg, Florida, where my husband and I are taking a little break from New York. Uh, I would always say that home is New York City, but we now live in Shelter Island that is also home. So um, it's great to be here. And uh, my setup here is a little different, and I'm easily boggled by technology, which I... I always find it so refreshing how this this whole scene that we do together, we're we're really open and, and kind with each other. My my gallery in New York, Carter Burton, is like that too. They meet once a month, and you know it's not just all about the the uh, you know going for the latest ego, whatever we've done, but more about about sharing and community. It's so important. Um, uh, I'm going to share my screen and just uh, I didn't really prepare anything formally at all, but. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and just um, share a few things I've been working on while I talk about a few concepts. Can you guys see my screen with an image on it? Yes. 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 Oh, okay, thanks. I know we need help. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to bring up the concept that we've been talking about here, layering. Um, I've said it many times that I got into digital because my paintings filled up with squares and, and pixels in 1981. Uh, so it's all been an accident. But um, I, layers have, I mean, that was the first accident. But when I look back, all the paintings were filled with layers. And also the concept has been uh, occurring to me more as uh, people have shared things like the piece that Rafik Anadol is, has at the MoMA right now. You know, it's animation, it's gorgeous. I haven't seen it, but I, I just find his work luscious and incredible. And we talk a lot about animation, but the concept I want to bring to the fore here is I've always been a painter. And, you know, we bring up animation here, but my layers, it's all to me about diving deep, deep, deep into a still image that sits there forever to be contemplated, just like any painting from like thousands of years ago. So I just want us to kind of focus on that thought because a lot of us are talking about layers, but we're talking about the way that our work with this particular medium especially allows us to, I mean, there, there's just no limit. And I find that just, I mean, totally fascinating. 
Um, and I, I tuned in into a um, Monday Mints, uh, Monday Night Mints, what's it called with Tommy? Um, the Spaces on Twitter. It was afterwards, but I listened to it later and he said something to the effect of, Tommy said something like, he was showing one of his incredible, you know, photograph montage things. It's a still image, but it's like all over the place. And he said something like, um, it's, it's one place, but it's every place. And uh, I really related to that uh, as, uh, I mean, physically, spiritually, artistically, creatively. Uh, you know, my first pieces in New York were about, I, I've always kind of reached out to the common people and me being one of those, but not so much to the museums as much as, you know, I would always paint people having bologna sandwiches like on Fifth Avenue and you know, it would be all their layers and what are they thinking about and, 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 you know, do, do they like bologna and did they just go to the deli and did they break up with their boyfriend and those kind of things. So I'm just taking you, um, talking a lot, but taking you kind of sharing my, my thoughts and feelings. Um, and here in Florida, it's been such a surprise to me, um, that I'm, I'm doing these iPad paintings that have been germinating for a while. I've usually been in Photoshop and I've shared with some of you my pieces called Diamond Scapes that are these still images made of multi, multi, multi images that you peel back. But I haven't done so much on the small level with my iPad and I find it so refreshing. This piece is called, um, these are just really kind of hot off the press in the last year or so. Uh, this is called No Diving, uh, No Diving, No Control. And there are tons of layers in this using Procreate. And I love using my hand, the way you can just be so loose about it um and uh it's really sort of uh it's it's about it's becoming more my work is becoming more abstract as i get more and more layers going on in it so that's another concept um here's a recent recent one that i just did in the last few weeks um and it's called um navigate in florida the long goodbye and i'm also contemplating you know a lot of us are some are younger some are older but I'm, I'm really, you know, when I told my friends in New York, I was going to Florida, I said, yes, I'm going to purgatory. And, um, you know, maybe that was a little snotty thing to say, because you know what the truth is? We're, I mean, I'm taking water aerobics in the morning and fluffing around in the water with everybody else who's looking at the, we're looking at a different perspective in life. And I certainly one of the older ones in the group. Um, and, uh, and I'm really, instead of removing myself I'm just jumping right in there and going yeah like you can look in here and see there's hello and death and heat and all sorts of things going on um but I'm I have, I've heard everybody talking about narrative but this is flat as a pancake and it, it wants to stay there I mean I could make it into a diamond scape and go deep in the layers which is possible um anyway meandering here and sharing with you um something I'm kind of working on right now where all the layers all just kind of obliterated each other in this huge, there's a Ferris wheel in here and it says floored in the middle and the suds are breaking out. And, you know, I'm kind of playing the dark, funny side of, of looking at death. I mean, no matter how much comfort you have in Florida, we're still going down the same road. <laughs> it's, and I'm, um, I'm just, I don't know, really enjoying this series. Um, didn't have too much more to say, except that my layering started after 9-11 when I was practically on my knees, thinking life was, and there were just things going on in my life where I didn't know how I would go on. And I, there are just all these surprises in life. You know, I, I was doing digital media, but I went to this icon course and um, I guess, I don't know, I guess, let me see if I can, I could show a few of them, but uh, this icon course where I, I went with a bunch of others after seeing a show that said icons were a source of comfort to a nation besieged. Like I didn't just come to layering out of technology. I came out of a need and a thirst and a, I, I heard, wow, how are my pieces talking to people? And icons, even though I'm still not really that fascinated with them, um, I, I, I'm fascinated with them for what they represent. Oh wait, they're coming up on the wrong screen. Uh, like you start with this board and you sand it down and there's there are these layerings and you're sitting with a group of people. I was the only professional artist in this entire group. Um, and I don't mean that in any, it just was interesting. It wasn't really artists. It was for any, you copy, you're copying. It's an Eastern kind of Orthodox rabbi who's training us and you're, you're looking at this one big thing and doing all these layers. And I'm bringing this up to you because it's all flat and every color and every line meant something. And 
I was in such a dark place and my whole ministry side, uh, some of you know I'm an interfaith minister, uh, very into Jesus, but into everything. Um, and uh, and, and sh in this this thing, every, every material, every color, everything in the piece means something. It, it means something, it has symbols and it's inviting you into a conversation with a painting in a way that I had never really considered before. And, and that's, um, these aren't perfect at all, but I, my mind was reeling because I worked in the web, I worked at the World Trade Center and, you know, and I, I was doing digital paintings and I, I came back and put, back, put the web and the Photoshop and the layers and everything all together so that people could go inside a work of art. Um, Anyway, I'm just sort of rambling. Am I going too far? I, I, I could stop there, but um, thanks for listening. And uh, I love this group. I think it's fabulous what Colin has started here. And I, I think it's a great record for our time, uh, what we record here. And the, and the caliber of the conversations are, have, have really uh, been something to me. I've, I've always been very impressed. And, and I like the, um, the sort of way he's, he's set it all up. I'll, I'll stop sharing. Um, but thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> it's great to be here. Thanks, Roz. Awesome. Yeah, even, even your more uh, what you would call simple pieces still have the, the Roz diamond feel. So <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you. You know, I talk about paradox a lot, but I just love the paradox of Florida. <laughs> like, you know, pina coladas, greenery, so, I mean, comfort, and, and yet people... I don't know, you know, art is about touching and that's been always my mission. And I look at people and they're fluffing around the water next to me and everybody suffers and everybody has joy and, and artists can connect to that. If we forget why we're here, we do bring something so incredibly important to the world. So, you know, you might get a little, it gets dissuading out there, especially in, in the world we're working on where our visual language is becoming everyone's. <laughs> but But we are witnessing, I feel we are witnessing to that here as yes. uh, with what we're doing very much. And um, appreciate being part of that. Awesome. Uh, Tommy, you you volunteered as well. You, you're you still up for sure. sharing? <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to follow um, Roz's enthusiastic presentation. I don't know if I could match that energy and enthusiasm <laughs> though. I'm, um, uh, in uh, the city so nice, they named it twice, uh, calling it from New York, New York. And a lot of my work involves this a work that I think, oh my goodness, I, I can't talk and tap at the same time. Hold on one second, bear with me. Everybody's so nice. Share content, screen, narrating us through here, sorry. It'll be good for the recording. Um, okay. We're looking at an image that I made in 1999. Um, Michael, I see you there. Can you wave to me if you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a, a image that I created um, actually in as everybody's talking about a uh, Corel photo paint um, in 1999 um, for, from some scanned negatives uh, that I made um, uh, photographing the uh, amazing cathedral in Barcelona uh, built by well, design by the architect Antoni Gaudi. Um, and the name of the place is the Sagrada Familia. And here I'm zooming in a little bit. And um, when I was there, uh, it wasn't complete. I'm not sure if it's still complete, uh, incomplete, um, but th there was a lot of construction going on. Uh, two facades, this is actually two separate sides. It's sort of impossible. One of the things that I was thinking about when I was, um, this is uh, an undergraduate work, when I was an undergraduate considering our architecture, um, especially as a form, is how to convey a three-dimensional space in two dimensions. How do you present a building in an image? Um, and what I was doing here is walking around the building, cutting apart the pictures. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, Here we could sort of see um, the edge of the building that I cut and then 
putting behind it a layer behind it of maybe the um, ceiling actually is the, the background <laughs> of most of this, except for that little cloud in the upper left hand corner. So this is the sort of idea of uh, layering. I think we're all talking about this, the lingua franca of, of um, digital imaging, maybe. Um, and I, um, using this as a language, I, I was thinking about how to um, really draw, you know, uh, as people are talking about here, you know, the, these narratives, these ideas of stories, of, of perceptions. Um, this is a project I was feeling kind of a misanthropic, I guess, in 2008 after the, the crash, uh, the economy, um, I was thinking about that as a crash cars. And I just went out on the internet, finding all the pictures of crashes, cut them out, layered them on top of one another. Um, pretty pleased with this, I didn't mean to pull that up. Um, but um, uh, so what I was doing a lot of is working, cutting out layers. And that idea of not just the layer, but also the layer mask is one that I, I find um, Uh, in making work. And so here's my curve that, um, oh, it loaded in a different place. Um, this is uh, a layer mask that I generate by comparing uh, two different pictures. And let me just say, let me go to this version over here. Um, two different pictures for um, areas of difference. And what's different is um, indicated in white. And those areas are then uh, cut and um, added into um, what I would call a time-lapse collage, um, which uh, you know really is this idea of layers and layer masks. So, you know, I feel like cutting out layers is a whole other interesting facet of, of how layers can work. And I'm going to stop there. I'm try to stop sharing. <laughs> oh, did it work? Okay. Whew. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tommy. Is there anyone else uh, who would like to make a short presentation? Are there any questions for the presenters? Well, I just typed a question in for Tommy. I so see that. <laughs> Yeah, are you using the layer mask as kind of a negative space idea, or you know, do you want to elaborate a little more? Because you just said you loved making layer masks and dropped that wonderful idea right there. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to let it, you know, sort of settle for a while after we drop an idea like that. Um, yeah, I think layer masks, you know, um, are an interesting form that. Um, for me is reminiscent of like a negative in the dark room as well. So I, I, yeah, I'm generating layer masks algorithmically and then um, using them in one way sort of um, to, uh, as a template for what to reveal in this building, you know, time-lapse collage, but also on their own as this black and white uh, image that um, has a very uh, uh, readable, you know, the, the pattern recognition functions in our mind extraordinarily well with this very minimal amount of information too, which I think is a fascinating um, thing perceptually with those black and white layer masks. So I'm not sure if that was your question, Cynthia, at all. I hope I answered part of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, yes. And it also spurred this idea reveal because um, I didn't present this week because I presented, you know, two weeks ago. It's like enough. But I, I think of layers as giving us the opportunity to reveal. Like I use the eraser as a revealing tool, not as an eraser. Uh, so, and I see that in other people's work too. So I'm gonna let other people think about that, talk about that. Um, could someone uh, and, uh, want it? Oh, uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Bernita. I was just going to fill the conversation. Um, well, I uh, wanted to ask the various artists who presented today um, whether or not they feel that um, the layers uh, bring 
what's in, in their heads into a view in a three-dimensional way, um, almost like a, a hologram projection, a holographic projection. Um, is that intentional or is that something that I'm just seeing because, you know, it's a subjective assessment? Uh, well, for Neda, for me, that's exactly um, exactly what it is in, in my creative process. Um, I'm working in a three-dimensional space, like a hologram. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you definitely got there. <laughs> I, I'd like to say, too, uh, Renata, that, um, and I can't touch it on it in a five-minute <laughs> presentation, but I'm a writer. And I've been writing stories, small stories, sudden fictions for years. And so being able to cross the other medium into the visual adds this almost hologram kind of um, connection between the two, where the stories then themselves become, for me, like Roz, being able to go into. So in a way, yes, yeah, definitely hologram. Cynthia, go ahead. Uh, I think, Renata, that's a, a, a great question. I think within my own work, I often call my pieces that are manipulated and have form. I'm trying to cross the barrier. I almost call it like 2D sculpture, uh, if you will, and it's not going to come off the page. And I don't make it leave the page in any way, but I do like to create depth and I that's important to me uh, with many of the pieces I work with. So yes. Uh, I'm gonna tag in there. Um, interesting question, Bernada. Um, mine, it's funny. Uh, it's For me, it's all about creating these transparencies. I use opacity a lot. I actually haven't talked about that much, but that's a real key to a lot of what I'm doing. Um, what my, some of my diamond skips are like 300 layers of history. And when you look at the still on the wall, you can actually find all of the layers in some capacity because I leave the opacity such that everything's coming through each other in some way. And, and I'm, I'm still trying to make something that's flatter than flat that amazes me that can hold an infinite amount of text and materials and and, and drawings and just, I mean, and I'm yet, I'm very obsessed with the two dimensional space and it might lead me into 3D if I go out, output something in that way, but I'm still very obsessed with that 2D. I remember being interviewed years ago and someone said, well, don't you miss that texture and that? And I'm like, well, even my paintings were pretty flat. They weren't just filled with, I wasn't one of those painters that would layer thousands of layers like that. I would leave a lot of open space. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm tackling in a little different way. And the process, when I really get loose with it, especially with the pieces here, they're not commissioned or that I'm not, I don't have a definite story to tell, but but it's just loosening me up. I almost feel like the layers, they just, when you said, are they, they're revealing me and emotions and things that are coming out that are surprises. And of course, you know, Photoshop and any kind of layering program, you can turn it on or off a million times and drive yourself crazy. So um, you got to kind of know where you're going because, yeah, you, you got to, well, you don't have to, but it, it helps. But I, I love how, you know, with painting, if I go back to oils and I put down something on the canvas, it's going to be hard for me to go, but, but wait, I'm going to undo that and then do that different. It's going to be very tough. <laughs> so. Indeed. <laughs> Great question, Vernada. Thanks. Yeah. Who else? Ha any any other questions? Yeah, I have another question. Sure. Okay. Well, um, do you find in dealing with multiple views of reality, have you ever encountered? the creation of a picture where phenomenologically you could say um, you had projected into the future or captured something that hadn't happened yet or uh, 
uh, found like a, a quasi crystal ball type function <laughs> for what you're doing or do the layers just remain static in time? If that's making sense. Well, Fernando, for me, because I'm working a lot with narrative, like I said, I, I don't have my stories here and how they match with my images, but that's what's running these all the time. And sudden fiction um, is usually just one character and it ends on a, an epiphany, uh, but doesn't tell you what that is. And so what you're doing is projecting to the audience a vision that they need to step into their own future with. So in a sense, that's kind of how I'm projecting the future in my own work. That's interesting, thanks. Yeah, I'm not sure I totally understand. Are you saying, is there some kind of, um, and maybe I just missed it, um, gestalt thing that happens where you see something that you didn't plan to create or is that not well, right? Well, um, do you, because you're dealing with multiple uh, views of reality and sometimes abstractions of reality because a lot of the times the layers are manipulated. Um, I'm wondering, do you sometimes in shifting space and time, do you like stumble into uh, uh, a realm or incident where you hit upon something that hadn't happened yet. Um, and you look back on something and you say, wait a minute, here's a, a shadow of this, that, or the other thing that occurred in this painting or this artwork that I did, you know, X number of years ago. Um, or realization that um, you might have about something, but you hadn't had it as of when you created the artwork, but something that occurred years later that somehow you manage to communicate to your future self. Um, do you encounter that um, at all? It may not happen a lot, but it, I'm just wondering, that, has it happened at all? I feel like with the work I've been doing lately, um, you know, it wasn't something that I had thought about, like, you know, in 1999, 24 years ago, as a, even a possibility really you know um and it was sort of like a, you know an aha moment when i saw that you could import illustrator documents into at that time when i first started playing around with this idea it was in flash you know and it would bring all the layers in into the animation software and it was like wow it was like made to do this even though i didn't really think about it at that time and like the first iteration of this idea was probably like um, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, I did a collaboration with this German musician, this drum and bass um, composer um, named Intersolar. And like, we came up with this idea of doing a piece where he would create like a drum and bass track an electronic track to uh, like a sequence of these pieces animated. Um, and then when the blockchain happened, it was like, okay, now this is this is the place I have to put these things, you know, and kind of rebuild a bunch of them. But it was an interesting, you know, um, thing that happened, you know, jumping back to work that was done so long ago. And, um, you know, it's still being usable. And that's what I love about vector work is, you know, it's so easily adaptable in a variety of ways. Yeah, so maybe some part of you actually anticipated <laughs> that such a function would be necessary in the future or useful in the future, but maybe it, it did not exist at that point in time. And so inadvertently you designed with the future intent without really knowing it. I, I agree with uh, Colin's uh, comment about something from the past. When I had shown you my work, that original um, piece that, um, started the whole thing, which was a painting that I had done a long time ago. And I kept dealing with it and manipulating it and changing it till it eventually became something quite different. And it, it, it created a space 
that I had never seen before, I had never anticipated. And I think that part of the creative process is that uh, we have this underlying, these underlying things within our unconscious that come out in our work. And then eventually, if we continue to work with them, become something else that we had never anticipated. And I think that happened for me with the very first piece that I showed you, which was very dark, looked like a night sky and what it became. And then I eventually minted it as an NFT. So I think there is that um, something in, in the whole creative aspect of creating work. Yeah, it's almost like a, a type of prophetic component. It, it, I mean, not in the, big, the grand sense, sense of prophecy, like we think of in, in terms of literature and sacred texts and whatnot, but nonetheless, a forecasting that becomes a manifest down the line. Yeah, I don't know if I'm twisting your words. I don't want to, but I will say when I look back in my own life in this whole arena, it, 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 there's a, there's a story. It's, it's, and, and maybe all of us had that story. I can see it in others, but it, it wasn't like intentional. Um, and you're part of the inventive process and it's part of you, but I don't know. I'm, I, when I think of all the layering and the things that are possible that we're doing with technology, I mean, I'm probably going to end up doing paintings that are just mud. I mean, I've never done abstraction, but I'm doing such, I'm getting into, to me, that's like an aha. I'm looking back at my work now and going, oh my God, it's getting so, so many layers and things. And, and you can, and I love that I can bring them up and reveal them and like a diamond scape kind of type thing. But, but there, there, it's like, I look at one piece, I go, oh, it looks like mud and it's 300 years of history and it's all these grays and browns, but there's a big aha there of a whole new kind of art coming out. So I don't know if that's what you're saying, but I have a lot of ahas. Not all, well, not a lot. I know I'm big energy, but it's, but I do have some big ones where it really connects to my earliest days, drawing mm -hmm. and painting, where I think I was searching for something and beyond that brush and, and that brush keeps evolving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It keeps, it keeps telling the story, even after yeah. you put it down in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I, this is Susan, and I am connected, but I'm, I'm uh, on my way someplace. And uh, this part of the conversation had me riveted because <laughs> I feel um, often when I do a presentation at the salon, and that's why I like the salon so much, is it gives me an opportunity to look at my work through the uh, theme and then see the connections through the uh, different times that I create. And what Renata is talking about in terms of things that are gonna be revealed, when I was doing layered dragonfly cyanotide, I never dreamed I would be creating self-portrait melded pieces with AI characters. But all of that in a way has to happen in order to, in, in order for the things to happen now that I'm doing, all of that informs what I'm doing now. And uh, talking about the um, uh, seeing things ahead, I, I, sometimes more now than before, I try to envision, and I didn't used to do that. I used to just start working and see what happens. But in some of the work now, I'm envisioning a bit more what the end result is gonna be. So anyway, I wanted to speak because I was very taken by this line in the conversation. Thanks for putting up with the background noise as I walk. <laughs> oh, you sound fine. Thanks a lot. That sort of reminds me of a lot of conversations oh, that I read and heard when I was a teenager. It was called Taking Advantage of Chance. Some people are bright enough, intuitive enough to take advantages of chance. Other people are um, shy, to use a charming word, um, and less reluctant 
to do anything when they're confronted by a phenomena that happened by chance. That's a very interesting um, statement. <laughs> well, it came about through Jackson Pollock. He was okay. the one who was being interviewed. People were asking him, well, how did you feel when you just threw this paint and it made this splatter? And he said, I thought I saw it as a great opportunity. Not right. to say, it, oops, I made a mistake and spilled the paint. No, that's not what he said. <laughs> He saw it as an opportunity for exploration. Right. Right. Well, I have to interject uh, the word. Did you say shy? S H Y? Shy, yes. Well, <laughs> I know when <laughs> I tell people I was painfully shy, they don't believe me, but I was. And I think that I think that um, art is a it's a language by uh, which we express ourselves. And shy kids aren't always they're not. I wouldn't say afraid, but they haven't found who they are and how to get it across. And art is um, can be such a powerful thing for a shy kid. Certainly was for me. Music too. That's right. Some people, when they do this sort of thing, they don't want to acknowledge it because they don't want to be confronted by the question, why did you do that? They don't want to hear that because they don't want to answer it. That's being shy. At stepping back away from what you just created rather than moving forward with it to see where it will lead. I'm not sure I agree with your definition of shyness, but that's why we're here. <laughs> we well, I, have, I have a I have a counter uh, perspective on, on that, Roz. And and I think, you know, thinking about my own childhood, um, if the if the society of the people around you don't understand your perspective um, and you're not a type a personality to you know kind of go out there and fight for it um you just kind of withdraw and and for me that was very much um uh, my 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 childhood growing up is i knew a lot of stuff people didn't understand what i knew and it was hard to explain it to them. So I didn't try because it wasn't in me to try to, you know, grab them by the scruff of the neck and say, no, here's, here's what I know. Um, and yeah, it does take a while to get your voice, but as a kid, man, I just, it didn't feel worth it to me. Um, so yeah, that, so that's, that's my, my perspective on it. And once you get your voice, then you then you then you can yeah. really, really well you get to a point at least when we get this old, it's like you don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> and we can be something to those young people coming up who are trying to find theirs. I mean, yeah, that's, that's I agree. So important. No, I totally agree with that. I, I think another element is fear. Um, whether you want to call it shyness, it, you know, fear of uh, what my peers will think, fear of the fact that what I'm doing, I like, but someone else might look at it and say, oh my goodness, what is this? What are you trying to do? So um, I think it's important for us to, for the young people around us, that we try to help them deal with that. I, I do it with my granddaughter. I tell her, you're gonna meet art teachers that are gonna tell you that you gotta draw inside the line. You gotta do this, you have to do that. And I said, well, you let them say what they want, but continue to do what you love. And maybe you won't show it to them, or maybe you will if you have the courage. But I think that is so important. The I, is trying to counteract that fear or the fear of making a mistake, not getting it perfectly done. And for all anyone knows, perfect is not what was needed. I mean, again, you made reference to Pollock. I mean, certainly people would say, I've, I've heard other teachers when I taught in schools see some kids imitating Pollock in the school parking lot and they were appalled at what these kids were doing. Um, so, but the, but these kids were afraid to do it. And so again, you know, that's, that's part of it. And I, I think it's true for all of us, even when we were young uh, or even when we're older. 
Well, the amazing thing with Pollock is a little bit like uh, Van Gogh's letters, but with Pollock, um, the media latched on to this and they made it a national discussion. It was in magazines. I used to hear adults talking about it where these adults would never talk about artwork. It really intrigued me that all of a sudden, these grown men would start talking about this artist. You heard about this an artist named Pollock throws paint around and they're, and they're talking about it. You know, that was the first time I could recall a public discussion about something that an artist did rather than just a, com a conversation that saying Da Vinci was a genius or Rembrandt was brilliant. Um, no, they were questioning his whole approach to art, his whole uh, notoriety about having uh, enough courage to put this out here and show it to people and demand that they discuss about it. You know, it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful, especially when he himself brought it right down to that one saying, taking advantage of chance. I agree, Lee. And probably what I'm going to say next sounds a little strange, but Marlo probably knows where I'm going. <laughs> um, I'm always asking myself, where is this going in my artwork constantly, like with every brush and, and whatever. And, and it made me think that my first husband, who is not with us, he would have loved this group, um, is a brilliant painter. He could paint literally like Rembrandt by the time he was 12 ended up giving up painting and going into found objects. We had a giant junkyard in our backyard, as many of you know. But he built time machines. And our gallery was filled with time machines. And one of these clients came in and they had a little kid. She was three years old. And she immediately ran up to the time machine. It was small enough. She jumped inside. <laughs> grabbed the steering wheel and the parents mortified and the kids said to the parent my husband and I were like yeah um but the parent the kids said to the parent no you go I'm driving I'm going over there <laughs> and it was wow. like this perfect innocent description of art it's like yeah get in the time machine go over there <laughs> So I just yeah, thought I'd bring that up because it kind of goes through the topic that everybody's talking about. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's amazing that you're talking, you mentioned the time machines when part of my question was, does, is there evidence in anyone's mind that the layering and the bending of space and time that we do using digital media in any way manifests? as being outside of the linear time that we're experiencing when we are creating the work, you know, at that moment. So, and here you come with the symbol, the literal symbol. <laughs> oh, can't hear you, can't hear you. Well, it's interesting to contrast uh, Jackson Pollock's public presentations and discussions with Van Gogh's letters to his brother, because his letters are his personal explanation about why a painting or a drawing looks the way it is, why he made it that way. And he never uses the term taking advantage of chance, but he implies that that was sort of a guiding star that made him do this unusual image the way he did it. Um, he makes it very personal. Um, but it's always what I would call romantic. <laughs> He's in love with making images. He's in love with art. Um, and he's expressing that love uh, in any way he can um, to go beyond just what the image looked like. Because he was always outside, you know, doing supposedly plain air painting, which is, is kind of ridiculous when you, when you think about it. Because he would sit there, obviously looking at a landscape, but he never painted that exact landscape, he never tried to paint it the exact way he saw it. He always interpreted it uh, in a very romantic way. Well, I look back at my life and I think, you know, the interruption of those squares coming into my paintings. And I, and I tell younger artists, you know, if you have an interruption, listen to it. 
that can take you in a whole new curveball. I mean, people are saying, oh, you should keep doing your beautiful paintings. I mean, I could draw and paint my socks off and it would have been much easier. And I started doing these clunky things. Uh, and that's where, yeah, you got to follow, follow, follow that thing that's pulling you somewhere important. The interruptions can really be important. And, and it's a risk. We all know. I mean, gallery doors closed right away. Like oh, what, what, what you're painting with a clunky computer tool to get those squares that speak to this world now? Yes. And um, so our dialogue here is very interesting. It's, it's multidimensional and layered as all of us are as well. That, that's what makes this group so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the layering of the conversation is deep. It's right. really yeah. is. <laughs> Many well, layers. I'll, deep. I'll make one last comment. I personally believe that if you do not take advantage of chance when it's presented to you, in the long run, you will make yourself ill. Well, you know, Langston Hughes and also scriptures um, speak to that that uh, hope defers makes the heart sick, you know? And a broken spirit dries up the bones. Absolutely. You know? That thing that wants to become, if you don't allow it, it will, it will eat you up inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even if you pay a big price for it, but still it's worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, I had uh, had my own moment of shyness where I did not share a piece of creative writing that I did to um, explain a, a particular point of view that I had to a friend. And uh, the play was just my way of working through issues to make a point in a creative way. And, but I got scared of what was said in the course of writing the dialogue. And uh, I said, well, yeah, maybe I'll just keep this to myself. Uh, because you don't want to insult people, you know, and you don't want to be presumptuous. And, but when does that become uh, distilled to you just don't want to be? Yeah. Instead of you just don't want to be X, Y, and Z, you just don't want to be. Yeah. And so now after this conversation, and I'm thinking, well, maybe I need to just go on and send the play. <laughs> If they get so insulted, I could always apologize. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that. And, you know, well, that would be a lie. You know, but it's, it, it, it's good to be able to rethink things. Mm -hmm. So thanks, everybody. Yeah, I, think, I think that danger of self-editing um, is always present, especially for people who have any introspective bone in their body. and. And at some point, that does become destructive if if you let that predominate uh, who you are uh, as a person, as an artist. So, yeah. Well, as William Blake said in his Proverbs of Hell, he who desires but acts not breeds pestilence. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Wow. Well, look. Well, listen at that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Hey, uh, I could say something to this. I usually don't say anything, but I'll say something to this. Um, we've all spent a lifetime of learning how to respond to what inspires us. Um, and on our journeys, we've learned how, you know, all the different ways to respond. Um, and what we get from that, and to kind of lean back towards that that quantum question that Bernada posed early, um, I think when we look back at and review in review of the works that we've done, we're reminded of uh, what inspired us then, but also also um, how we chose to respond to it. And in that, I think we are allowed to remember. Um, bits and pieces of who we are um, and bring that forward um, in relevance to what we're doing now um, and what we might be doing tomorrow. And I'll end on that. Sounds good to me. Thank <laughs> you, Bradley.
So I guess we're getting close to wrapping up time here. Um, any, any final thoughts? This has been an awesome conversation here. Really has. This is what, this is the value I draw from this group. <laughs> so thank you all. Yeah, keep taking the chances. <laughs> yeah. My mother always said life is not a dress rehearsal. It sure is it. <laughs> so for those of you that are um, new to the salons, um, we do a little um, sort of after party slash advisory board slash community building session once the recording stops. And the tradition for a little while now has been that we select uh, collectively select the topic for the next salon. Um, whoever sticks around. So uh, you're all welcome to uh, stick around and help choose a topic for next time. And uh, thank you, Michael, for moderating. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, appreciated. And, no, I, I'm, I'm very happy to have done that. And I just want to plug Cynthia Beth Rubin's uh, SIGGRAPH announcement. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to check it out. So yeah, thanks, Cynthia, for sharing that with us. Yeah, and I'm happy to you know answer any questions with the after party time a little bit. Cool. Um, all right. You have a show right. up, don't you? You have a show yeah, up. Yeah. Can I also plug that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a show in New Haven, and if anybody wants to show up on Sunday to come to New Haven for lunch at noon, um, you're welcome. Let me know so I can send you the RSVP form because. Um, it's in a synagogue, so we have a we need a guest list. <laughs> um, but happy to sh I hope people come and maybe we'll record it if I can find volunteer recorders. Awesome. So, all right. Well, well I guess uh, without further ado, um, like to thank you all. Thank the uh, all the artists who presented yeah. and. Uh, we will stop recording in three, two, one, and cut.